welcome to the lecture for Psych 310. We're talking about dissociative uh, disorders and somatoform disorders. Uh, so one of the first questions you might have is, well, why are these two different classes of disorders in the same chapter? Why are we talking about them together? Uh, well, a lot of it is because the er our early knowledge uh, of both of these groups of disorders have come from the same source, and that would be the, the cases of hysteria uh, that uh, people like Freud and Charcot uh, worked on around the, the turn of the uh, century, uh, where uh, people um, had uh, a variety of symptoms, uh, usually uh, physical uh, in nature, uh, sometimes paralysis, uh, sometimes blindness, uh, sometimes other uh, physical symptoms uh, that couldn't be explained by, by any kind of recognizable medical condition. They seem to have a psychological origin um, and these people also experienced uh, bouts of amnesia and uh, experiences of uh, fainting and losing uh, kind of uh, awareness of where they were who they were which now we'll talk about being uh, dissociation and uh, these uh, symptoms were thought at the time to be ways of, of dealing with trauma or from a, a psychodynamic psychoanalytic perspective uh, threatening impulses from the id right so there were these uh, um, sexual or aggressive impulses that they unconsciously had that they couldn't deal with. They were too threatening to uh, admit into their um, um, awareness via the ego. So the impulses were converted into these other symptoms, um, both in terms of dissociation and in terms of um, expressing physical symptoms. Uh, so that's why they're in the, the same uh, same chapter, uh, and they both seem to be sometimes, for some people, uh, different ways of dealing with um, traumatic or, or stressful events. So we'll talk about dissociative disorders first. Uh, and when we talk about dissoci dissociative disorders, we first need to make sure we understand uh, what is meant by dissociation. So, simple definition. Dissociation is a disruption in the usually integrated functions of consciousness, memory, identity, or perception. That's a nice fancy way of saying that usually we know where we are, where we've been, who we are, and what's going on. And all these things are related. Um, part of knowing uh, who you are involves knowing where you've been and what you see or hear. So um, who you are, what you remember, what you're seeing now, they all work together to give ri rise to one unified consciousness. You are you, are you, you remember where you, where you have been, you know where you are. You know who you are, and all the things are working uh, together. And dissociation uh, implies that some of those processes have been separated, uh, are currently separated, or have been separated at some point in the time to where they're not uh, fully integrated, so that some things you've seen or are seeing aren't accessible to your uh, current awareness. Uh, so you might have a, a hysterical blindness we used to talk about, where um, you you your eyes are working fine but you can't see anything, or maybe just be certain things that you can't see, um, would be uh, one type of dissociation, or there's certain things you can't uh, remember. Uh, so memory has dissociated from conscious awareness. So uh, think about disso dissociation being like disassociated, so separated, a separation of parts of consciousness. Uh, we talk about three different um, aspects of dissociation when talking about the disorders. Uh, one, uh, depersonalization, um, the kind of I'm not me feeling. Uh, this is when a person loses a sense of their own reality. So um, in these instances, the, the world uh, is still uh, uh, real, but you're not, uh, you lose a sense of who you are. So this is like when you're, you feel like you're watching yourself uh, in a movie or in a dream. So in the dream, it's the real world, and there's people, and you know them, and you, you may recognize them, and they all seem normal. And you see, even see yourself, but how can you see yourself? You are yourself. So you, you get that sense of uh, a loss of the sense of uh, who you are. Uh, not you've forgotten who you are, but it feels like you're not yourself, but you're watching your own actions um, uh, play out in front of you. Um, like if you've seen the, um, the movie uh, Being John Malkovich, where they climb the John Malkovich's uh, brain, that would be kind of a depersonalization where you're seeing things, but you know it's not. You, you're getting the inputs, uh, like you plugged a cable into somebody's uh, head, uh, and 
you're seeing, what they see and hearing, what they hear, but it's not you. That would be uh, depersonalization. Derealization, uh, similar, but a uh, distinct process. This is, uh, you're, you're real, but the world doesn't seem real now. Um, so the, the world seems uh, uh, like it's dead, like I'm me and I'm walking around, but this isn't uh, the real world. It seems like um, life has been sucked out of it, and, uh, and all these people are, are robots uh, around me, and they're not, I've been in the real world, and this isn't it. Or I feel like I've, I've been um, transplanted to some sort of uh, bizarro world, some sort of alternate universe, um, where I, I know who I am and I'm seeing this stuff, but this stuff isn't real. It doesn't feel real. It doesn't feel in terms of the very kind of subjective sense, uh, uh, cognitive, but also emotional sense. Uh, so depersonalization, derealization, and then third would be amnesia, which is probably the easiest one to understand. And you can't remember. So. Um, and the thinking with dissociative amnesia is, is that um, either at one time you remember something and then you the mem became dis dissociated from your consciousness, or more more likely, when the uh, thing happened that you can't can't remember now, you dissociated. You experienced depersonalization or derealization at that point in time, and so the memory didn't get encoded. So, um, like if you ever if you've ever been uh, watching. Uh, TV, a really good show, and maybe somebody tells you to take out the trash, and uh, you hear them, but your attention is pretty focused on this TV show, and so you don't process it very deeply, and then later they say, hey, you take out the trash? No, why? Did you want me to? So that would be a very light version uh, of amnesia, where um, your attention, so something uh, came in and was, was processed by your senses, you heard it, you smelled it, you saw it, but it didn't get past a certain level uh, into the into the brain, uh, it seems, or or is inaccessible uh, from where it is uh, at the moment. So when you can't remember uh, an event, uh, it seems to be the memories was not stored. Some either wasn't stored at all, or wasn't stored in the typical way where it's easily accessible. Um, so uh, these are things that again parts of the normal human experience. Uh, if you've ever uh, zoned out, right? If you're driving, um, maybe you're going on uh, on vacation, and it's uh, uh, during the week, and you find yourself uh, pulling out of your neighborhood and turning to go to work or to school, and, and then realizing, oh wait, I'm I'm not going there. I'm on, I'm on vacation. What was I thinking? Right? Where you kind of dissociated from it. You had a purpose. You knew what you're doing, and then you can't remember maybe uh, turning or, or uh, why you went that way. You kind of got in this habit, and we uh, have some uh, automated thought processes where you get these routines, and you kind of lose a sense of where you are and what you're doing briefly, um, or experiences of, of deja vu. Uh, they seem to be somewhat related to uh, experiences of dissociation, where things seem a bit unreal. Like, oh, have I been here before? This seems like I've, I've seen this before, I, or I knew this was going to happen, but it doesn't quite seem real. So that's related to uh, the experience of dissociation, uh, and obviously with not remembering things, most of us can identify uh, identify with that. Um, so again, pieces of normal uh, human experience, but differ when it becomes a disorder in terms of uh, the degree of dissociation and the uh, uh, amount of impairment and distress it causes. Okay, so the dissociative disorders we talked about are depersonalization disorder, dissociative amnesia, dissociative fugue, and dissociative identity disorder. Okay, so we'll take these uh, in turn. Depersonalization disorder, uh, characterized by persistent recurrent experiences of feeling detached from and as if one is outside an outside observer of one's mental processes or body. So, more than one experience of depersonalization. Right? That's the key feature of feeling um, like you're outside of your own body or your own uh, awareness and you're watching yourself somehow be yourself. Right? So it happens uh, more than once, it's persistent uh, or recurrent. Not just, you know, one time, not enough to diagnose. It has to happen uh, more than once. Um, and then to rule, and that's the key feature, but to then rule it out from other stuff, uh, we have to say, well, the depersonalization experience, uh, when it's happening, reality testing remains intact. By reality testing, you know it's not real. So uh, 
you might feel like you're watching yourself on TV. But if anybody asked you, uh, so were you really watching yourself on TV? No, I wasn't, but it felt that way. So there's this sense of unreality, but you still at some level have this kind of cognitive awareness that it's not reality. Once you, if you lose that sense of what is reality and what isn't, and you can't tell the difference, then we're moving into um, psychosis, right? Kind of delusional disorder, schizophrenia uh, type stuff. Depersonalization disorder, not that you know that it's not real, it just, you know that it, you're not watching yourself, but it feels that way. It's all about the subjective experience. Um, and also, obviously, the, uh, the depersonalization causes clinically significant distress or impairment. Um, so if it happens a lot and you, you find yourself zoning out a lot, if it's not getting in the way uh, of stuff, and you're maybe just kind of a daydreamer, and you maybe even enjoy it, then it's not a disorder. It's only a disorder if it causes a problem. And then another uh, set of rule out criteria. Uh, the depersonalization does not occur uh, only during the course of another mental disorder. So, because it happens uh, for people who, some people who suffer from schizophrenia. So if you have schizophrenia and you have experiences of depersonalization, then it's not schizophrenia and depersonalization disorder, it's just schizophrenia. It has to be one of the symptoms. But if you have depersonalization without the other symptoms of schizophrenia, then it's not schizophrenia, it's depersonalization disorder. Uh, also, panic disorder. People, uh, if you remember, uh, we talked about panic disorder before, uh, some people experience uh, uh, depersonalization, derealization during a panic attack. So when their heart starts going, and they start breathing faster and they feel like they're going crazy, they may start to dissociate and feel like they're watching themselves have a panic attack. If so, it's not depersonalization disorder. It's still panic disorder. That happens within the course of that disorder. Uh, it also happens uh, with PTSD, right, with flashbacks, uh, depersonalization and derealization, and also dissociative amnesia happens in PTSD. But it, if it happens only with PTSD, then it's not this disorder. If the PTSD, if the panic disorder are treated and you no longer have panic attacks, if you no longer have panic attacks, but you still have experiences of depersonalization, then it might be depersonalization disorder. But if it only happens in the context of another disorder, then that other disorder accounts for it better. It's a piece of another set of symptoms. Um, but if you don't have those symptoms, you just have this, really this one symptom of recurrent depersonalization, then we uh, will term it depersonalization disorder. Um, uh, one more thing to, to notice about the experience of depersonalization disorder is that uh, individuals who uh, are diagnosed with this also tend to have um, atten attentional difficulties even when not having um, episodes of depersonalization. So they have a harder time uh, tracking and paying attention to things. Uh, this shows some attentional deficit cognitive with ADHD, um, which may indicate, in a very kind of, uh, using kind of a uh, crude metaphor, uh, this faulty wiring where the connections among different parts of the brain uh, that give rise to consciousness, something isn't working quite right with them regularly, and then there's these certain times, usually during uh, intense uh, periods of intense stress, where the system gets overloaded and things really uh, get separated or dissociated, uh, and you have that experience of uh, depersonalization. Okay, uh, dissociative amnesia. The next one, uh, obviously, uh, the key feature of predominant disturbance is one or more episodes of an inability to recall important personal information, usually of traumatic or stressful nature, that is too expen extensive to be explained by ordinary forgetfulness. Um, so we all forget things, uh, and some, some of us uh, more than others. But still, there's kind of this continuum of ordinary forgetfulness. But then beyond that, we have the extraordinary or unordinary uh, forgetfulness, where if you can't say at all what you did yesterday, that would be extraordinary. If you can't say uh, with, uh, with clarity what you did um, three months ago to the day, you know, three, three months ago today, exactly, what did you do that day? That's probably not dissociative amnesia, amnesia right? That's ordinary forgetfulness. But if you say, okay, uh, uh, about five years ago, where did you live? Most people can recall where they live, right? And, Assuming you haven't moved, you know, a thousand times, you you know that information. Right? It's personal information that uh, we can usually pull up pretty easily. So this is beyond ordinary forgetfulness, where 
there's really these, uh, these holes in memory that um, that are not just, oh, I can't remember the periodic table. Again, it's personal uh, information about yourself, who you are, uh, what you did, where you lived, who you were with, uh, blocking out uh, those things. And usually, again, it's related to stressful uh, or traumatic um, um, things. So if you were in a car accident and have no memory of the car accident, that might be associated with amnesia. Um, I hope you remember from uh, when we talked about PTSD that um, inability to recall uh, important aspects of the traumatic event is a symptom of PTSD. So dissociative amnesia in the course of PTSD is a symptom of PTSD, and it's not dissociative amnesia too. So one of the rule outs is, well, this forgetting, uh, this amnesia doesn't just happen in the course of certain other disorders like dissociative identity disorder, dissociative fuse, PTSD, acute stress disorder, somatization disorder, uh, and it's not due to uh, a drug, you know, you aren't, you aren't, it's not a blackout from drinking too much or, or getting stoned, it's not due to a uh, general medical condition, a, a brain tumor, where there's not uh, a medical cause, and it's not due to one of these other uh, disorders. So it's having this symptom without the other symptoms that would uh, merit diagnosis of a different so it's just the forgetting without the other stuff. Okay. Uh, and then obviously it causes um, clinically significant distress uh, or impairment. Um, and uh, one other disorder, kind of step back for a minute, one other disorder that um, you can have and have dissociative amnesia that uh, may co-occur with some frequency would be borderline personality disorder. People with borderline personality disorder tend to have uh, some individuals with borderline personality disorder have dissociative experiences, and one of the common uh, ones is dissociative amnesia. Uh, but as we'll see uh, later on down the road, uh, some people with borderline personality disorder actually, if you spend enough time to find out, you'll learn that they meet criteria for PTSD, at which point they would no longer meet criteria for dissociative amnesia because it's, it happens in the course of uh, the PTSD. Um, okay. uh, people that uh, uh, have this diagnosis, who are, are diagnosed with this, uh, research has found that uh, they tend to be highly hypnotizable, which I have mentioned before, which is true of um, individuals with any of the types of these dissociative disorders we're talking about. They'll be higher in hypnotizability um, and in measures of abstraction um, than, than other um, individuals. Okay. Uh, dissociative feud which is kind of like dissociative amnesia plus. So this is uh, sudden unexpected travel away from home or work with an inability to recall one's past. So there's some dissociative amnesia here, but also travel. That's what fugue mean, right? means is flight. So uh, you left wherever you uh, were, and you can't remember stuff. If you didn't leave, it's just dissociative amnesia. But if you left, now it's a different disorder. It seems a bit silly, but... Uh, other criteria, uh, there may be confusion about uh, personal identity or assumption of a new identity, which may be partial or complete. So uh, let's say you're living in, in um, Colleen, uh, working at the uh, gas station, uh, and then you, uh, uh, one day your, your family finds you, you're gone, uh, and they find you uh, three months later uh, living down in San Antonio, working at the, uh, the dog track. And you know your name before was um, you know, Stan Jones, and now you're Stan Smith. So maybe you kept part of your, your name, but not the other part. And not because you think I'm going to change my name and hide, but you can't remember anything. Oh, I think it's Stan Smith, Stan Jones, whatever. So uh, you may partially accept, uh, adopt a new identity, where you keep some parts of your old self. Oh, I know I like um, uh, to uh, to watch uh, uh, football. I can remember that about myself, but I can't remember uh, if I have a family. So you may uh, remember parts, but not all. Or it might be a complete uh, new identity, which is assumed, uh, which is somewhat uh, somewhat rare. Um, interesting, though, whenever people do uh, adopt a new identity in the, these cases where they've been discovered, usually uh, at uh, police stations or ERs or when they've been reported missing and people track them down, their new identity is usually more more gregarious, more outgoing, and less inhibited than their typical self, which might be telling in terms of what's going on. So, if somebody's living a very kind of uh, repressed, boring, dull life, and they're very closed off, 
and they want to be different, but they don't feel like they can be different, there might be part of them, consciously or unconsciously, that seeks out this other self, this other part of themselves, which is the life of the party, the fun, outgoing person who doesn't care what people think. And it seems to be that, you know, people who are outgoing don't run away and then create this new identity of someone who's very shy. So it's interesting. Um, some rule out stuff uh, it does not occur only during the course of dissociative identity disorder uh, because obviously as we'll see in a little bit dissociative identity disorder involves um, uh, having a, a kind of a different different personality so it used to be called multiple personality disorder uh, it's also not due to a substance so you're not you're not uh, you know dropping shrooms uh, or something like that and it's not due to uh, a general medical condition and it's also clinically significant causes clinically significant distress or impairment um, so dissociative view is incredibly rare. Um, there's a 0.2% prevalence rate. So very few people are diagnosed with this. Um, sometimes you hear about it in the media, somebody having dissociative fugue. A lot of the ones you hear about in the media eventually find out that they didn't really have dissociative fugue, they were faking it. They uh, owed money to somebody, were unhappy with their life, and just left and started a new identity somewhere else and then were found out. And when they were found out, they claim uh, to have this kind of, oh, I, I, I don't I'm, it's coming back to me now, and they claim to have dissociative fugue. Um, so, and there are cases of people uh, faking this, but then there are other cases where um, there's no clear reason why somebody would fake. Uh, they had maybe a, a, a fairly decent life, and their new life isn't much better than the, the old one, where we think, okay, well, it seems like a real uh, thing, but it's uh, incredibly rare. But uh, interesting, nonetheless. <clears throat> now, the one that most people want to uh, talk about, kind of the most interesting of the dissociative disorders, and the one that, um, if you meet criteria for this, kind of trumps all the others, because all the other dissociative disorders really um, are features of dissociative identity disorder, kind of the broad umbrella. And so if you meet criteria for this, you don't get the others, too. You, get, you just get this big one. So dissociative identity disorder, formerly um, multiple personality disorder, right? Um, but renamed um, because the research suggest that the key feature of DID is dissociation. It's not these multiple personalities. That's, and there's debate about whether or not they are distinct personalities. The key feature is dissociation. Uh, and dissociation related to identity. Um, so anyway, the criteria. Presence of two or more distinct identities or personality states, each with its own relatively enduring pattern of perceiving, relating to, and thinking about the environment uh, and self. So, what's a distinct identity or personality state? Uh, depends on who you, who you talk to. Um, some people talk about these distinct personality states being alters, um, uh, where there's kind of your, your main personality and then uh, various alternatives, uh, which in short term refer to as alters. Sometimes uh, the alters will differ in age from the main personality, maybe even gender. So, uh, there might be uh, a woman, uh, a middle aged woman, who has an, an altar that uh, is a, a, a big, strong, uh, and angry man, but also uh, another altar that's a, a small, frightened uh, little girl. Um, but you have to have at least two uh, distinct identities of personality states where there's uh, uh, this kind of both a subjective experience of it being different, but also uh, observers uh, would, would say, okay, this person is acting differently now than they were before. And it's not just that they're in a different situation. In the same situation, this person is acting differently whenever I'm talking to them and they're in this state. Um, and sometimes the, the transitions uh, between or among alters uh, are identifiable by things like uh, you know, eye fluttering, uh, things that look like uh, almost like they're going into a trance. With some people, it happens very. It can happen very quickly. You know, they'll blink twice, and then they'll be talking in a very different way. The tone of voice uh, might be different. Um, the, the language and the vocabulary used uh, might differ. Um, so, at least two distinct identities. And one thing I want to talk about is, uh, I want to mention here is that usually, whenever the uh, the cinema, the movies have, have portrayed um, multiple personality disorder uh, or dissociative identity disorder. They've done it and they've called it uh, schizophrenia. They've shown someone 
uh, acting as if they have two different personalities and then they say oh they're schizophrenic uh, and as we'll see later when we get to schizophrenia that that's not at all they're different things schizophrenia and dissociative disorder, disorder really don't have much in common uh, people with one don't typically have the other people with schizophrenia don't have multiple personalities they have sometimes exhibit some really um, uh, aberrant behavior that is confusing to people and they'll seem like wow they, they got a lot of different personalities in there they don't they have one personality and they have some problems with uh, their cognition and possibly hallucinations and delusions but it's very distinct from the social identity uh, disorder okay uh, so social identity disorder at least two identities usually uh, more and at least two of these identities or personality states recurrently take control of the person's behavior so it's not just that uh, you feel like okay I'm a you know a shy rather inhibited person and I feel like there's this extrovert inside of me that just wants to get out and I can clearly feel that that wouldn't be DID DID is there's a shy you're a shy inhibited person and then uh, there's some sort of switching and now you're an extroverted outgoing person who is different from the other person with the same physical form but your behavior is now different. Uh, your thoughts, your feelings are different. And uh, at least two of these different identities or alters uh, are in charge of behavior and go out and act in the world uh, at different times. Um, another criteria, there's an inability to recall important personal information that's too extensive to be ordinary forgetfulness. So there's some dissociative amnesia. Um, and the, the thinking with this uh, for DID is that uh, you know, people might uh, you know, wake up in bed next to uh, a stranger and they go, oh my gosh, who is this person uh, that's in bed with me and how did they get here? I, I can't remember that, um, how this happened. And the thinking is with DID, you got in bed with that person when a different part of your personality was in control and that there's not uh, information shared across the different identities or personalities. And that will differ across individuals the degree to which information is shared uh, and that uh, somebody is aware of what they did when a different personality uh, was in charge. So inter-identity and amnesia uh, is, is common, uh, but not always the rule. Sometimes uh, they know, okay, yeah, I remember whenever whenever the angry man was in charge, he you know, uh, got in a fist fight. And so he told me about it. So there may be communication, but sometimes there's not. Uh, and to meet criteria, there have to be at least some instances of dissociative amnesia where you don't remember uh, what happened uh, or, or what you did. Okay. Uh, and then a, a rule out criteria, it's not due to uh, uh, substance or general medical condition. Um, and that, that's DID in a nutshell. Uh, which again, the name change is important because um, it seems to be at least in, in the research literature, about dissociation and splitting off parts of uh, identity that are incompatible. And it's usually, uh, it seems like, not uh, when we have these two different identities, they're not two, two fully formed, uh, multi-dimensional personalities, right? Like, I talk to you as a person, you have a multi-dimensional personality. Sometimes you're happy, sometimes you're angry. Sometimes you're outgoing, sometimes you're shy. Right? You have all these different aspects of yourself that are fully integrated into one person. With these alters, they don't seem to be that way. They seem to be somewhat one-dimensional, where there's a really shy personality, and the shy personality is never outgoing. And then there's the outgoing personality, and the outgoing personality is never shy. So it seems to be it's not really different personalities in there. It's different aspects of the personality, of the identity, that are split off from each other, where you can only be comfortable being, uh, having certain traits and characteristics in one uh, in one setting and kind of seeing that as one identity and split it, splitting off, dissociating it from uh, these other aspects of the self. Uh, if you want to um, look a little bit more at uh, DID, there's a, a the Dissociative Experiences Scale by Bernstein and Putnam, which is a, a screening tool that's been used for DID, which it's not uh, a diagnostic tool. So it's not like, oh, well, if I'm high on this, uh, I have dissociative identity disorder. But it is used uh, whenever you're trying to find people with dissociative identity disorder and also with any dissociative disorder, uh, and you don't have time to do full depth uh, diagnostic work with every single person. But you get a, you know a thousand college students and you want to find ten that have DID, you can give them this tool, and maybe you'll bring back uh, 
you know, 100 out of 1,000 that score high. And then out of the 100, there might be 10 that actually have the ID and the rest don't. Um, so it's not diagnostic, but it is a screen for its use. And uh, high scores, people that score high on this measure, 17% uh, of them in, in one study, in the Bernstein and Clayton study, uh, actually had uh, dissociative identity disorder. So if you want to uh, look at this, um, here's a website, uh, counselingresource.com slash quizzes slash DES, which stands for Dissociative Experiences Scale, slash index.html. Uh, and you can uh, look at the um, diagnostic tool yourself uh, and kind of get a, get a, maybe a better feel of what kind of things are they asking people about to determine if they have, if they're at higher risk for having the social identity disorder. You know, so it has to do with a lot of stuff about uh, in terms of uh, abstraction and getting lost in thought uh, and fantasizing. And not so much about uh, just, you know, are there multiple people inside of you? It's not, not quite that simple. Okay. So, uh, for the skeptics out there, uh, hopefully you've, uh, and hopefully most of you are skeptics, the question occurred to you, well, is this even a real thing? Is this a real disorder or is this something that's been created? So one of the questions comes up is, well, are people faking? Are they just faking to get out of stuff? Uh, and some people, yes. One of the most famous would be the Hillside uh, Strain Worker. Um, uh, he faked having dissociative identity disorder. You know, they, they found all these uh, psych textbooks in his cell. And, uh, and one way to define it that people are faking is to kind of subtly give them uh, false information about disorder. And it's like, oh, well, you know, a lot of people that have DID also report that their dreams are in black and white. And the next day I ask, hey, tell me about your dreams. Oh, last night I dreamed all in black and white, which has nothing to do with DID. It doesn't even really happen. Um, so there are these kind of subtle ways of interviewing people to figure out if they're faking or not. Um, and yes, some people have been found to fake the social identity disorder. Usually when they had a good reason to, like the Hillside Strangler, trying not to get executed trying to establish kind of an insanity defense, uh, which as we've talked about before, uh, is rarely used and rarely successful. It wasn't successful for, for him either. Um, so, yes, people do fake it. But just because some people fake it doesn't mean it's not real. It's like some people fake uh, having um, uh, cancer, which seems horrible. I think it's horrible for people to do that. But some people have been known to fake having uh, these other diseases. It doesn't mean the disease isn't real. Same thing with dissociative identity disorder. Just because people fake it doesn't mean it's not a real uh, experience. Uh, so the other question is, uh, if people aren't intentionally faking it to, to get something or get out something, might it also not be real because it's created by therapists? Might uh, therapists be planting the idea of dissociative identity disorder in people's minds? Uh, and one person who, who agrees with that to some extent would be uh, Spanos. He talks about this uh, socio-cognitive model uh, of the socio-identity disorder, uh, which you know, Spanos doesn't say that DID is, is fake. He believes that the symptoms are real, that people really do have these dissociative experiences. But he talks about the existence of alters uh, being a product of interaction among the client, the therapist, and society. So there's this social cognitive process where social interactions and thinking about uh, um, these terms gives rise to the belief that one has um, alters. Um, and one thing that uh, Spano cites to, to support this is that um, whenever uh, if a, somebody talks about having uh, an alter or two alters, if a therapist suggests, um, you know, some people have many alters, it's pretty common that the person will then come back the next session and have more alters. Um, so there are aspects of the experience that seem to respond to therapist uh, input. Um, and also, beyond the therapist, we also know about the, the influence of the media, kind of the, the social uh, influence. Uh, whenever there's a movie that comes out about dissociative identity disorder, multiple personality disorder, the rates of diagnosis go up. Uh, when, you know, whenever uh, Sybil came out, uh, the numbers went way up. And it could be that people uh, with DID um, are confused and don't know what to name it, and then they see a movie, and they go, oh, that's what I have. That's the name for my experience. And I have just what they have. Or it could be that people have these social experiences that aren't, they don't understand, and the, the movie portrays a misunderstanding of it, 
and then they say, oh, this is what I have, even if they don't have altars. And they begin to, you know, I wonder, well, I wonder who else is inside of me. Well, sometimes I feel like a scared little child. That's probably my child altar. And they'll begin to create this um, uh, alternative personality in their own mind. Um, and there is, uh, so there is some evidence for this in terms of we can uh, increase the number of alters in theory by suggesting it. So people do respond to uh, people who, again, let me slow down. People that experience dissociation and suffer from dissociative disorder of any kind are higher in hypnotizability and suggestibility than other individuals, which puts them at risk to develop kind of misunderstanding of things due to therapist suggestion. So people who have dissociative experiences, if a therapist suggests, is it possible you have alternative personalities, these people are more likely to accept that than other individuals. So there is some support for kind of Spanos's uh, skepticism about uh, the existence of these alternative personalities. Uh, counter to that, there is some evidence for um, kind of identifiable differences among these alters. Uh, talking about uh, some people with DID, I mean it's not all of them, but some of them show differences in physiological measures, including EEGs, uh, when in different identity states. So when they're the young boy, or the, the older woman, their EEG looks different. Uh, and that's something that's hard to fake. Uh, but we don't know enough about the brain yet to be confident to say, okay, that's clearly a different personality state. It could also, these uh, different physiological differences in physiological measures could also just be indicative of uh, an ev evidence of ability to concentrate differently when in different, different states. Uh, so that physiological data is a bit ambiguous but it is still interesting that certain things that are, are hard to fake, they're different when you're in this person's state, personality state, than when in, in, in this one. Um, so the the debate continues um, in terms of if if it is um, and not so much uh, the dissociation that seem to be the the existence of dissociation and problems with identity uh, and not being sure of, of who you are. That's fairly well accepted in the, the therapy community and the research community. What's controversial is the existence of these alternate personalities. And then uh, Gleaves and others have, have reacted with uh, the statement, well, does it matter at all in, in terms of therapy? Not necessarily research, because for research, yeah, it matters to find the truth. But in therapy, does it matter if alters are, are real? Uh, and there are some that have argued that, no, it, it doesn't matter, that your treatment won't differ if these are alters or if these are just um, kind of fractured pieces of a personality. You know, are you trying to reintegrate pieces of the personality or are you trying to reintegrate different identities? Either way, the reintegration process will, will be the same. Um, the, the approach to treating, treating people um, will, be, uh, will be similar. Um, we'll talk about in, in just a second. So uh, the debate isn't, uh, isn't uh, over. And even, you know, the, I mentioned Sybil earlier, one of the most famous cases that was made into uh, a movie. Uh, there's debate about that, about whether or not uh, Sybil had alters or whether or not uh, they were uh, a construction of her therapist. Uh, part of that is there was a therapist who saw her briefly when her main therapist went on vacation, uh, and, and that therapist indicated uh, that uh, the first therapist suggested and created uh, these alters. But then there's questions about that person's motives, and we don't know. Um, but what uh, what does seem to be true and real is that a lot of these people that are uh, diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder aren't faking uh, their experience of dissociation, and they frequently have some pretty um, horrific pasts. Like uh, Sybil was a victim of um, really kind of unspeakable uh, abuse at, at the hands of her parents. Um, these kind of horrible experiences that makes sense that they would have a profound impact on identity and holding your your reality uh, together. So these aren't people who are just uh, uh, faking uh, to get attention. Horrible things have happened and they've got some, some problems um, piecing together um, consciousness and who they are. So that is real. In terms of are they really different personality states or just different aspects of personality? Not clear. But again, it, it may not may not matter. 
So let's look at this, this social disorders as a group in terms of uh, causes uh, and treatments. In terms of causes, like most things, there seems to be a general biological vulnerability. Uh, experience of dissociation seem to have some heritability, uh, runs in families to a degree. Um, but usually, um, in terms of kind of a diastasis stress model, you have to have a stressful event. Most people don't have kind of happy-go-lucky lives and experience regular regular uh, dissociative events. There's usually something really bad uh, that happens. Um, could be kind of PTSD type stuff. Can also be um, kind of chronic abuse, where uh, you know horrible things uh, are happening or is, are about to happen, and you need to check out. You need to get your mind out of there and not focus on uh, what you're seeing and feeling uh, and smelling all those things and you need to go somewhere else in your mind and if you do that enough you might eventually lose control of your ability to direct what you're seeing hearing feeling smelling remember uh, and so another thing that may contribute to a cause is a lack of coping skills uh, so and we think of, think of dissociation as a coping mechanism so if you don't have other ways of coping with the, the, the horror of the trauma or, or the abuse, then this is kind of a, a last resort for some people. That, okay, well, I, I, I can't talk to anybody about it. I can't uh, self-soothe by reinterpreting this event in some way. Uh, you know, I'm not, not uh, going to be abusing drugs, using some other coping mechanism. The body does this to protect the mind from, uh, from further damage. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, treatment, Depending on uh, what the disorder is, you're generally going to look to identify the trigger. So, what triggers your experiences of dissociation? If you're having recurrent experiences of depersonalization, derealization, um, going off to different identities, what makes that happen? So, identifying those triggers and trying to find some way to, to neutralize them, which you can use some uh, some of the stuff we know from uh, uh, working with anxiety disorders in terms of. Exposing people to triggers. If you expose somebody enough, uh, the trigger loses its, its power. Um, um, but then also, like I said, for dissociative, dissociative disorders, usually there's some stress events, some trauma uh, going on. So the treatment, by and large, will involve processing the trauma. So treatment for dissociative disorders and dissociative identity disorder looks very similar to the treatments used for PTSD. And if we think about uh, dissociation being a way of coping with this traumatic event that you can't um, include as part of who you are and make sense of in terms of a piece of your identity, then the only thing to do is dissociate. But if we can uh, get you to think about that trauma, let it become a part of your past, you know, a memory that has a place in your life, then perhaps um, you will no longer need to use dissociation to, to cope with the, the painful emotions that come from uh, that uh, the memory of the traumatic event. Okay, now let's talk about uh, the somatoform disorders. Uh, so we talked about dissociation being a key feature of um, dissociative disorders. A key feature of the somatoform disorders as a group is the presence of a physical uh, symptom or symptoms that suggests a general medical condition but aren't fully explained by that general medical condition. Uh, briefly, the disorders we'll talk about are hypochondriasis, somatization disorder with the related diagnosis of undifferentiated somatoform disorder, Conversion disorder, pain disorder, and body dysmorphic disorder. So the first one, hypochondriasis. Uh, most people are familiar with the term hypochondriac, uh, which comes from uh, this diagnosis. So uh, the key feature uh, and number one symptom would be preoccupation with fears of having or the idea that one has a serious disease based on the person's misinterpretation of bodily symptoms. Okay, so either. Uh, you're preoccupied with fears that you might have uh, a disease, or you actually think you do have uh, the disease, and you're preoccupied with having it. So, oh, I think I might have it. I don't know what these things. Or you have it. I definitely have it. Either way, it's based on a misinterpretation uh, of bodily symptoms, uh, and the the symptoms might be symptoms of uh, a real disease. Uh, it might be symptoms of a cold. They might just be normal bodily sensations or there might be minor physical abnormalities. Uh, so if you uh, 
uh, when you're climbing stairs, if you get out of breath and your heart rate speeds up, if you climb you know, three or four flights of stairs, that's what the body does, especially uh, as you get older. Uh, but if you do that, you think, oh my gosh, my heart is beating a mile a minute, I can't breathe, oh, something's wrong with me, I think it's a tumor. And that would be hypochondriasis. So it's not that you're, you're feeling fine, there's nothing going on, you think, oh, I definitely have a tumor. It's, it's asymptomatic, I have no symptoms, but I know something's there. There are symptoms, there are bodily symptoms that are real, but they're just misinterpreted. They don't mean uh, what the person thinks they mean. And it's not just, uh, oh yeah, I think I might have this thing, but eh, whatever. You're preoccupied with it. it. It takes up a lot of your time thinking about uh, having uh, this disease or diseases or condition. Uh, and then the, the preoccupation persists despite appropriate medical evaluation and reassurance. So um, maybe you have uh, a, a spot on your skin. Well, that looks a little funny. Hmm. I just saw this thing on TV that talked about uh, these you know, misshapen moles. Uh, I think that might be cancer. I better go check that. And you're worried about it. Maybe you know somebody you know died of cancer. Well, I'm really kind of freaked out about it. And so you have a high level of preoccupation. And you go to the doctor, and the doctor uh, says, I think it's fine, but we'll biopsy it. They do a biopsy. Things come back, and it's benign. You say, oh, no, it's fine. You don't need to worry about it. That would be appropriate medical evaluation and reassurance. If you say, no, the, the doctor missed it. I, it's, I, I know they said it's fine. I know they said it was benign. But, the, you know, the test is only 99.9% accurate. It's 0.1% inaccurate. And I'm that 0.1%. I know that this spot means that I'm dying, that something's wrong. Uh, so there's a strong belief uh, in the illness that these symptoms are indicative of illness. But the belief isn't so strong, the preoccupation with the, the, or the idea that one has a disease, the belief in criterion A is not so strong, it's of delusional intensity. Uh, and it's also not restricted to a particular concern about appearance. And we say it's not a delusional intensity because then it's a delusion and it's a delusional disorder. So you really strongly believe it, but, um, and this is just a matter of degree to where um, at some point you can say, well, maybe I don't, but it feels like I do. Somebody who's delusional is adamant and there's no moving them off the point that, yes, they definitely have a disease and uh, and there's n there's no way that they could prove that they didn't have it. Some of the hypochondriasis might say, well, it might not be that, but then again, it might be this other disorder. So it's a, with enough evidence against you know one explanation, they'll come up with another one. Somebody who's delusional is going to stick to that thing and going to hold it uh, with an intensity that is uh, qualitatively different. You can tell the difference um, talking to somebody with a delusion versus uh, somebody who's just um, hypochondriacal. Uh, so it's not of delusional intensity, it separates hypochondriasis from uh, delusion disorder about being sick. Uh, it's also not restricted to a particular concern about appearance. If you, um, if it's just, uh, you know, my, my uh, uh, skin looks weird, it really looks weird and it really freaking me out, something's wrong with me, it looks weird, and it's just that thing about your appearance, then it might be body dysmorphic disorder, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, hypochondriasis is usually more about illnesses and disease, and not just about how you look. Um, so this preoccupation, this fear uh, and worry about being sick causes cl clinically significant distress or impairment, and it lasts a while, a duration of at least six months. Um, and this is a fairly long duration for, you know, a lot of the disorders say, well, it has to be at least a month of treatments. For this, we say at least six months. Uh, I think it's because the people who can determine this, obviously, um, I don't know if you know, uh, determine all these criteria by uh, taking a vote in a room with people. So, okay, are you experts? How many people think uh, the symptoms need to last for one month? How many say two? Do I hear three? Do I hear four? Six? You know, six months has it. They voted based somewhat on research, but based largely on their own clinical experiences and their expertise. So it's a bit arbitrary, to be honest with you. But uh, I think they moved this duration a bit longer than some others because there was a, a recognition and understanding that um, uh, most of us will have concerns about being sick and if you uh, have some symptoms that you're not sure what they mean it can be worrisome uh, and worrisome for, for some time where I'm really worried about this but then eventually the thing is eventually with enough medical reassurance we can uh, uh, calm ourselves and be reassured that okay, everything really is going to be okay I'm not 
not bad. So a fairly long duration of something to meet criteria for, for hypochondriasis. Um, and then ruling it out, ruling out other disorders. So um, the preoccupation isn't better accounted for by generalizing anxiety disorders. So this isn't just kind of one of many things you worry about. You know, with hypochondriasis, all your worry really is about having a disease. With GAD, you might be worried about paying the rent, about how your kids are doing in school, about how you're going to be evaluated at work. Oh, and also, I have this spot I'm not sure about on my exam. That's just one of the things. If it's just one of the many things, it's GAD, not hypochondriasis. Um, OCD can be hard to distinguish from hypochondriasis sometimes. If uh, somebody has kind of uh, contamination fears, um, so they're they're worried about uh, touching things uh, that have germs, and they have obsessions uh, about that. That's OCD. Um, even if, if they have uh, uh, intrusive thoughts about this, like it keeps, if it pops into their head, um, uh, you're sick and dying. You're sick and dying. Um, and the only way to, to relieve the anxiety from that is to, um, you know, wash their hands or count to ten or do some other uh, compulsion. And that would be OCD, not hypochondriasis. It's, and it can be a subtle distinction uh, uh, between those sometimes. Also, uh, panic disorder, we talked before about it, it may feel like they're having a heart attack. Some may, may think for a time that they have heart disease, but if it really if it's recurrent panic attacks and you're worried about that, uh, and just your understanding of it is, well, I think it might be an illness. It's not having a drive, so you can't consider. Uh, and then major depressive uh, 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 disorder, which we'll talk later, is characterized by major depressive episodes, periods of intense uh, depression. They often have somatic symptoms where you feel, may feel sick to your stomach and have a variety of, of somatic concerns. But if if your worry about being sick goes away when you're out of your major depressive episode, because people who have major depressive disorder aren't always super depressed, but most people who have uh, inter-episode recovery where their mood uh, comes up to normal or closer to normal for some period of time. When that happens, if your concerns about illness go away, it's not hypochondriasis. It's just due to the depression. And then other, uh, other sort of separation anxiety, uh, somatoform disorder. So other disorders that also feature concerns about uh, illness, if they're there, they kind of uh, take precedence. And somatoform disorder, which we'll talk about in a minute especially, it kind of trumps all the other um, uh, somatic disorders because it has a bunch of symptoms. Uh, but hypochondriasis is generally uh, worrying that you have uh, a disease and being preoccupied. And again, it's about the misinterpretation of bodily um, okay. In terms of uh, causes of treatment, um, like most things talk about, a non-specific genetic influence. <laughs> so, it, and all that means is it seems to run in families uh, to some degree. Uh, but it's probably related to uh, the same type of thing in terms of anxiety disorders and ability to deal with stress, uh, because hypochondriasis, kind of like um, dissociative disorders seems to be one way of dealing with stress. So, because uh, usually people that lead kind of happy-go-lucky lives don't report hypochondriasis. The people that have had uh, uh, some st major stressful events or some c chronic stressor in their life. And this seems to be a way of, of coping with uh, that stress and anxiety about something else. Uh, and the way we cope with stress and anxiety and the, de the degree to which we experience stress and anxiety seems to be genetically influenced to some degree, as we've talked about before. Uh, learning also probably plays some role in terms of uh, having uh, uh, people talking about illnesses modeled for you. Because uh, one of the things we know about uh, people diagnosed with hypochondriasis is that they, they often report a history of uh, serious illness in childhood themselves uh, and or uh, past experience with uh, illnesses uh, in other family members. So it might be that uh, they were really sick before at some point in time, and the world treated them in a certain way, um, and there are certain benefits to that that might make it um, attractive to talk about having disease if people pay more attention to you, that kind of thing. Same thing if you see other family members who are ill getting any kind of special treatment or uh, uh, avoiding certain duties. Uh, you can see where that seems rewarding. We're talking about reinforcement here that might make you more likely to cope with stress by uh, somaticizing and thinking you have an illness and talking about, you know, not being a secret. I mean, people that have hypochondriasis don't usually keep it to themselves. Um, 
it's about sharing with others because you have this concern about being sick. And then also, as I've already uh, mentioned, uh, frequently people with hypertrophic report a uh, history of uh, a stressful life event. Uh, and uh, disproportionately, that stressful life event for people with hypertrophic seems to be uh, some major loss or a death of a loved one. So it's something about being separated from ones we love, especially especially by death, that leads to this kind of concern with one's own uh, health and possibly mortality. You know, the person who I thought would always be there is gone. They got sick and died. Maybe I'm next. Maybe I'm sick now. Okay. That seems to happen. Uh, in terms of uh, what can we do in terms of treatment, one thing would be symptom reduction. Uh, so uh, inducing their symptoms, showing them how they, they, it is possible to create their own symptoms. So if we talk about being out of breath, you know, kind of like with interoceptive exposure with PTSD, have them run up and down the stairs and get out of breath and say, see, now you're out of breath. And you, you, you became that way after running up and down the stairs. That's a normal reaction. The way you're feeling, we can make you feel those things. And if we can make it happen, then maybe it's not because of some tumor or some internal disease process. Maybe it's a normal part of living. That can help some. Uh, and usually it's a combination of all these things in terms of the treatment approach. Uh, one other piece of the treatment might be challenging their cognitions uh, about uh, the illness. So, okay, you think that you, you're ill. What's, what's the evidence that you're ill? What's the evidence that you're not ill? And just kind of having kind of a rational uh, discussion with them and not telling them, well, it says here you're not sick, you're not sick, you're not sick. It's asking them, okay, uh, you say you're sick. Uh, how do you know? What's the evidence that you're sick? What's the evidence that you're not sick? Well, the evidence I'm not sick is these lab reports because I'm not sick. Why might this lab report be inaccurate? You know, what's the evidence that the lab is wrong? Well, I just feel it's wrong. Okay, well, you know, and you talk about how feeling may not be the best way to predict uh, the world. You know, talk about, you know, is it always accurate? Whenever you feel something is a certain way, is it always right? And if, it's, if, it's, if not, then you may not want to rely wholly on that as a way to live your life. Is there any evidence beyond feeling that it's not right? So kind of getting at the cognitions behind uh, their preoccupation. Uh, and then also thinking about this as, you know, a coping mechanism. So give them some other coping skills. So do some stress management training. Uh, targeting their overall stress levels because if we can make you overall less stressed, less, less anxious, then there's a variety of ways uh, of doing that. Emotion focused, problem focused uh, uh, approaches to dealing with, with stress, then you won't need to focus on these, these fears uh, of illness. Uh, and sometimes uh, uh, people will get better uh, with just reassurance by a mental health care provider. Uh, and sometimes <coughs> this seems to happen partly due to the, the medical system we've, we've created uh, here in the States, where somebody has a concern about uh, an illness and they go see the doctor and the doctor has you know, five minutes to meet with that person and they say, okay, you see you have these symptoms, let's run some tests, I'll be back later, can I better? No, you're fine, thank you, have a good day. And the person got the results, but they didn't get to talk about the results and how they feel about it and make full sense of it. Um, so the you know, the reassurance by the medical, uh, appropriate uh, uh, medical investigation, uh, what was the term, uh, medical evaluation reassurance, they may not have really gotten appropriate medical reassurance. Doctor may, doctor may have just said, you're fine, have a good day. Uh, mental health care providers uh, receive more training in, in talking with people uh, than, than physicians do. Uh, and sometimes if they can just talk with the person about the lab results and what it means, and sometimes that will help the person feel better enough about um, what they're going through uh, to get a different understanding of it. Uh, and uh, in terms of psychopharmacology, uh, anti-anxiety drugs uh, are sometimes prescribed. It's not clear yet um, the degree to which those are uh, successful uh, treating uh, this disorder. So the, the jury's still out uh, in terms of that, but it is one approach. Okay. Uh, so we talk about hypochondriasis, now somatization disorder, which is the, the, the big disorder. If you meet criteria for this one, then you don't get any other uh, somatic form disorder, really. Uh, and it's a history of many physical complaints, beginning before age 30, that occur over a period of several years and result in treatment being sought or significant impairment in functioning. Okay, so this is uh, 
complaining about a lot of stuff, getting a lot of tests done, a lot of treatments. And as we'll see in a little bit, it's a lot of symptoms. Uh, so this is beyond just, oh, I think I might have uh, a disorder. I've got this weird thing. It's, oh, I have, I have this pain here, and I've got this here, and I've got cramping in my stomach, and I can't, uh, uh, and my vision is blurry. It's several, several symptoms. Uh, and notice that the complaints uh, um, begin before age 30. Why is that? Why is that age thing in there? Well, uh, as somebody who's over 30, I can say, because your body starts to go downhill a bit <laughs> after 30. And the, uh, the idea being that if it's uh, a mental disorder and not just normal aging, then you're going to have these complaints earlier in life. Uh, and after 30, you might have most of those complaints that are uh, valid and accurate. And it might be harder to distinguish a uh, mental disorder from uh, real physical problems uh, and just uh, the product of, of aging. So it's something that uh, starts uh, fairly early in life. Uh, uh, think about it as in terms of a, a person, almost like a personal illness, which is a way of dealing with the world and a way of uh, dealing with stress. Uh, yeah. that, so it's something that starts early on. Uh, so in terms of all the symptoms you have to have, so each of the following have been met at some time. So not all at once. You don't have all these symptoms at once. But you have a lot of symptoms over the course of the several years it takes to, to meet criteria. So usually. This is a diagnosis that's made after somebody's seen doctors for a long time. And then finally some doctor says, wow, you've had all these tests done and all this, these workups and nothing's ever been found. Hmm, I wonder if you might have somatization disorder. So uh, unfortunately, something that's not usually not diagnosed early. Uh, and by virtue, it, it can't be. So at some point in time, you had at least four uh, pain symptoms. Uh, and they can be uh, four different sites or four different uh, functions. So it could be you know, uh, back pain, head pain, chest pain, pain uh, during sex, pain during uh, urination, um, you know, and the head pain could be uh, a unil unilateral headache, uh, bilateral uh, throbbing, uh, an intense sharp stabbing pain, so, but dip four, at least four different symptoms at some point uh, in time, uh, at least two GI symptoms, so uh, you know, nausea, uh, bloating, diarrhea, uh, at least one sexual symptom, uh, which could be uh, sexual indifference, you know, so having no sex drive uh, in men, erectile dysfunction. Uh, in women, oddly enough, nausea throughout pregnancy is considered a sexual symptom. Uh, uh, irregular menses also considered a, a sexual symptom. Uh, and then one pseudo-neurological uh, symptom, which uh, a pseudo-neurological symptom is a symptom that suggests a neurological condition but doesn't have a neurological basis. So uh, blindness, paralysis, uh, weakness, Anything where it seems like there'd be something wrong with your, you know, brain or spinal cord, but there's really, uh, really not. So at some point you've had all these symptoms. So that's what eight, eight symptoms, eight distinct symptoms uh, over the course of, uh, of these years, uh, and so you've had all these symptoms. And either uh, after appropriate investigation, the symptoms we just talked about, all eight of those, can't be fully explained by a known general medical condition or the direct eff effects of a substance. So if you, you know, are having stomach pain and they find an ulcer, okay, that's something that doesn't count toward this disorder anymore. You have to have another uh, GI uh, symptom. Uh, so all the symptoms have to be not fully explained by a, a medical condition you know, that we have lab results to show, okay, you have this problem, you have this, this tumor, you have this uh, disease, this infection, uh, or a substance, some sort of drug or poison, uh, allergy, whatever. Uh, so either that, or if there is a general medical condition, physical complaints resulting in impairments are in excess of what would be expected from a history, physical exam, or a lab test. And this can confuse people. So you can actually be sick and still have somatization disorder? Yeah. So you might really have, um, let's say you have you know, a, a tumor on your, uh, uh, on your kidneys. And there are certain uh, symptoms that might be associated with that. But if you, then if you have these other symptoms that are unrelated to that tumor and in no way makes sense given that tumor, you might also have, in addition to having you know, uh, renal cancer, you might have uh, somatization disorder. So you might have other symptoms or your symptoms might be um, uh, too much. So if, um, let's say you have uh, you know, a tumor on your, on your optic nerve that uh, given its location and size, should cause slightly blurred vision. 
but instead of slightly blurred vision, you report um, periodic uh, uh, instances of complete blindness. And as I say, neurologically, that that's not true. It, that doesn't work. You know, we see the when we do the brain scan, we can see your um, the, the, um, the the cortex uh, uh, lighting up, indicating that you are seeing things. The images that are hitting the eye are getting processed in the brain, and you are processing visual information. It's clear that you don't have uh, uh, blindness, but you experience blindness. Then your symptom will be in excess of what's expected, uh, given um, what I know about you medically. So uh, you can have a medical condition and still have this disorder as long as your symptoms are uh, excessive in terms of the degree of symptom or the, the number of symptoms. They all can't be explained by that medical condition. So you have all these symptoms and they don't make sense in terms of uh, any kind of general medical condition. Also, the symptoms aren't intentionally produced or feigned. So you're not knowingly uh, faking them or uh, producing them by you know poisoning yourself or punching yourself in the stomach. Um, so you're not knowingly doing it, but it's not caused by a medical condition. The thing is you are unknowingly or unconsciously producing these symptoms. So the symptoms aren't the result of the disease, they're a result of the mind. And, and people that have, maybe have a hard time Believing, well, how can you really? No, they know they're doing. It. There's no way you can make yourself sick, uh, and we know that actually, yeah, you, you can make yourself sick. If you've known anybody that's ever gotten hives, you know that's uh, um, kind of this medically linked condition where you have this you know, release of histamine, and we can identify the chemicals involved. But there's no pathogen out in the world that causes them. It's not an allergic reaction to something uh, in the world. It's stress and thinking a certain way causes a release of these chemicals and causes physical manifestation. Um, lots of skin stuff, uh, that is uh, uh, psoriasis, uh, not caused by, by stress, but certainly exacerbated. It gets worse in times of stress. So there is this mind-body connection, uh, and there, there's plenty, plenty of evidence that we can make ourselves sick. Uh, and not when we're trying to, but just that's a way that, for some people, that's how their body deals with stress. It comes out in the form of, of physical symptoms. Okay, so uh, this sort of, as I said, trumps all the other somatoform disorders. So if you have this, you don't also get hypochondriasis or pain disorder or the other disorders we'll talk about. If you have this one, uh, any other disorders that uh, it encompasses, you don't get the other one too. You just get this one. It's kind of the big, the big one. Now, uh, like I said, it takes several years to get diagnosed with this because it's a lot of symptoms. So frequently people that, that uh, are diagnosed with this, before they get this diagnosis, they're diagnosis is something called undifferentiated somatoform disorder, which is a kind of a lesser diagnosis. This is when you have six months uh, or more of one or more physical complaints that don't have an identifiable cause. So you have one symptom, two, three, four, until you get to the eight, you have undifferentiated somatoform disorder. And once you get to all those eight symptoms, having you know, the four, two, one, and one, so you got all those from those categories, then you bump up, you lose the undifferentiated, and you get the uh, slightly different but until then, you still can have a diagnosis that you can get treatment and they can do research in individuals by lumping them into a uh, group together. Okay, so in terms of uh, causes and treatments, uh, causes, uh, I didn't, didn't put it here, but probably a, some sort of genetic vulnerability. Uh, there seems to be a, a common, uh, one commonality among individuals in this group is uh, family history uh, of illness. So kind of hypochondriasis, that same kind of background where somebody in the family was sick. So the, in a way it seems that this, this, this learning that they learned uh, about uh, being sick, learned about expressing symptoms, and learned what happens when people talk about being sick uh, for good or for bad. Uh, and then, interestingly enough, I'm not sure what this means exactly, but it seems to be possibly linked to antisocial personality disorder, uh, which we'll talk about later. Antisocial personality disorder is the, uh, the personality disorder we will have a disregard for the, uh, the rights uh, of others. So most people in prison who um, are, uh, don't care about anybody else and they'll, they'll, they'll hurt anybody for their own means. Uh, some CEOs who uh, will do whatever it takes to, to make a profit and, and they'll violate the rights of others. So that they violate 
uh, the dictates of the uh, society that say that you can't just do it for yourself, that's antisocial personality disorder. It's linked to somatic vision disorder in terms of um, women with somatic vision disorder are um, more likely than the people in the general population to have a first degree relative with antisocial personality disorder. Which suggests that possibly there's some sort of common diet, some sort of vulnerability, you know, biological, genetic vulnerability that is expressed differently depending on gender role. So if you have some way of dealing with the world or maybe problems dealing with stress, we don't know, but if you're, if you have kind of the dictates of society put upon you as a man, or okay, it's, it's, it's not really okay to complain about being sick, but it is okay to hurt others. You know, we kind of glorify others who are able to be uh, aggressive and violent about the, uh, professional football. You know, uh, kind of that's uh, accepted, more acceptable for the masculine role. That might lead those individuals to seek out uh, behaviors that lead to a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder. And women where uh, uh, outward expressions of aggression um, are not tolerated. Uh, it's a violation of the gender role. So uh, a different way to get needs met uh, and deal with stress might be to uh, experience these physical symptoms. Again, hard to understand, but there, there's just this piece of evidence that they seem related in terms of these, this familial aggregation of the two disorders, suggesting possibly some underlying uh, similar uh, pathology, but not sure what it, what it means. Um, in terms of treatments, no documented effective treatment. So there's nothing that we can say, oh, well, this definitely works. Uh, really difficult uh, to, to treat uh, and to, you know, when you speak of, of cure, but to treat. Uh, but what uh, uh, strategies to reduce the impact of the illness uh, on the individual, but also on the society and the medical system is having uh, the, the gatekeeper position, which is what um, family practice, uh, uh, pediatrician, uh, general practitioner, doctors uh, have, have traditionally uh, been uh, having, you know, that's kind of for most people, you know, to go we'll see a specialist, you have to see your GP first and get referred. That's changing now somewhat, but for uh, these individuals, sometimes that's um, imposed on them. So after they've sought so many specialists and, and used up so much, usually of the insurance company's money, the insur insurance company says, okay, you've had all these labs done and these uh, treatments, and nobody's ever s diagnosed you with anything definitive in terms of the medical condition. We're no longer going to pay for anything unless you get a referral from this doctor here. This doctor is going to be the gatekeeper to make sure that you don't you know, go to one GI doc here they won't treat you, and then you go to another GI doc here, and they'll treat you. So we're going to have this one gatekeeper that keeps track of all your stuff, so you can't uh, doctor shop uh, and, and uh, get lots of procedures done. Um, that's one way to, to manage uh, the person's behavior. It doesn't really help them get better. It manages their behavior to some degree uh, and protects the system. Uh, and in terms of helping the person, the other thing that uh, we try to do is, again, reduce overall stress levels. If we think of this as a way of coping with stress, then let's teach you some other coping mechanisms and try to get your stress down so you will no longer need um, unconsciously to engage in these uh, these behaviors or, or have these symptoms. The next one, conversion disorder, and this is the one that uh, is most similar to what was previously uh, referred to as hysteria. This is where people have one or more uh, symptoms or deficits affecting voluntary motor or sensory uh, function that suggests a neurological or other general motor function. And that's a fancy way of saying it's, um, you know, so, uh, motor and sensory functioning. So how you're able to move around in your system. So uh, impaired coordination or balance, uh, uh, localized weakness where you know uh, just your, your left hand uh, uh, is weak but no, weak, no weakness anywhere else in your body. Uh, loss of pain sensation in certain areas. Uh, double vision. Uh, seizures. Um, blindness. Uh, you know, loss of sense. Anything uh, like that uh, would be a symptom affecting the motor sensory function, suggesting a neurological um, or other general medical condition. Um, And 
So you have at least one control, possibly more, and it's judged, which is my question, that psychological factors are associated with the symptom or deficit because the initiation or exacerbation of the symptom or deficit is preceded by conflicts or other stressors. So let's say you're saying, well, you didn't have this problem until, so you, maybe you have uh, an hysterical blindness you can't see, and you could see just fine until you walked in on your parents having sex. And then now you can't see? Okay, that's conversion disorder. You didn't get acid in your eyes, there's no physical trauma. There's a psychological trauma, some sort of uh, stressful uh, event or conflict that preceded the symptoms. So let's, let's talk about the initiation of something. Let's talk about an uh, exacerbation of the symptom. It could be um, uh, somebody who uh, uh, has had maybe relational difficulties and they uh, uh, recently uh, got married. And uh, whenever they're supposed to, they need to go out uh, in public uh, with their spouse, they experience uh, weakness in their lower extremities where they can't walk. And it only happens, or it gets worse, whenever they have to go out uh, in public with their with their partner. And whenever they're able to stay at home, it's fine. So the exacerbation, the worsening of the symptom or deficit um, is associated with conflicts or stressors. Um, and yet, the symptom deficit it's not intentionally feigned or produced. So again, it's, it's happening at an unconscious level. You're not uh, uh, faking that you, you can't walk or that you can't see. You're not trying to uh, uh, be that way. You're not knowingly doing it. But it's happening, and it's not explained by you know, a general medical condition. So after appropriate investigation, it can't be fully explained by a general medical condition or substance or as a culturally sanctioned behavior or experience. Um, so there's some uh, cultures and subcultures where uh, uh, usually brief experiences uh, of, uh, of paralysis um, might be uh, culturally appropriate. So if, um, if part of the, the culture and usually religious experience involves uh, a trance-like trance behavior uh, during any kind of religious ceremony or uh, obtaining of visions, um, if it's in the context of that, somebody who's in that culture, and that's how they understand it, then it's not conversion disorder. It's culturally appropriate. Um, moving back up uh, a, a tick, the first part of that, appropriate investigation. So what's appropriate investigation? Well, it depends on what your insurance company will pay for, to be honest with you. Um, so usually uh, brain scans, maybe some, some uh, neurological uh, testing, uh, doing uh, uh, psych assessments and stuff, if you've got the money for that, at least usually uh, some sort of uh, uh, neuroimaging study to look if there's any abnormalities in the brain or tumors related to uh, the symptom. Uh, how, much, uh, how much investigation you get, again, depends on your insurance and how wealthy you are, uh, and that determines realistically how much you're going to get in terms of how much is appropriate, that's up to a medical professional to, uh, to decide on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, like most disorders we talk about, it causes clinically significant distress or impairment or warrants medical evaluation. And then uh, ruling out other stuff, uh, it's not limited to pain or sexual dysfunction, it does not occur only in the course of somatization disorder, as we said, you know, trumps other things, uh, and is not better accounted for by another mental disorder. Um, so in the, uh, if it's just uh, a pain symptom, that's pain disorder, I'll talk about in a minute. Um, if it's, uh, you know, if you think about this paralysis being uh, related to kind of erectile dysfunction, that's a sexual disorder, not a uh, conversion disorder. Uh, and pain during uh, sex, as we'll talk about in a minute, is a separate disorder uh, as well. So not any of those things, and it's conversion disorder. Uh, and beyond the, uh, the, the brain imaging tests and medical tests, sometimes uh, uh, clever neuropsych evaluators uh, have ways of figuring out if um, a symptom is uh, consistent with uh, the way the brain works or if it's more consistent with conversion disorder. And one of the examples I always talk about is people talk about having uh, paralysis in their arm and if you hold uh, the person's arm uh, above held their hand above their head and then let it drop if they have conversion disorder their arm will fall to their side 
with the bone uh, that's necrosis, right? But somebody who really has uh, sclerosis, and, and, and you don't do this, but somebody who really has sclerosis, you hold their arm um, above their head with a hand above their head, and you let it drop. The hand will come down and strike them on the head before falling to their side. So most people have the um, kind of this unconscious self-protective motivation to where if they can if they can help it, they won't hit themselves in the head. Uh, and again, they aren't trying to fake it, but there's enough of, th of their um, uh, mind that knows that they're not paralyzed to keep the arm from striking themselves if they have conversion disorder. And there are a couple different little uh, tricks, uh, I would say, uh, but uh, assessment uh, uh, strategies to distinguish between uh, real neurological dysfunction and uh, conversion disorders. In terms of causes and treatments, um, like I said, with a lot of these things, some sort of traumatic stressful event usually uh, occurred. Uh, and for conversion disorder, it seems like the symptoms sometimes provided uh, escape from uh, the, the trauma. So like with the hysterical blindness, so you've seen something that you don't want to see, going blind is one way to stop seeing that thing, right? Um, or it could be th also thinking about kind of the, the dissociation. Uh, and if uh, um, somebody who's in maybe a, a combat experience and uh, other troops are being, being shot and they should go to run toward the shooting, which runs counter to most uh, self-preservation instincts, but they don't want to, and yet they don't want to, they don't want to see themselves as uh, uh, afraid or cowardly, and so they might experience a paralysis. Uh, I couldn't run. I couldn't get there because I couldn't run. And I still can't. I'm kind of paralyzed. I must have been shot. I can't move my legs. And not being able to move your legs helps them not uh, you know, run into the danger. So it is, they escape the stressful event because of the symptoms. And it's not intentionally produced, but it's the mind's way of protecting the self. And like most uh, somatoform disorders, uh, frequently a history of, of family illness in, among individuals with conversion disorders. So there's some, again, some role. Uh, those learning experiences. Uh, in terms of uh, treatment, uh, obviously they have to have appropriate medical evaluation first, make sure that it's not um, just a hard to diagnose medical problem. And then usually, like I said, the, the, the cause usually is going to be some sort of traumatic event. So like with PTSD, like with uh, dissociative identity disorder, you want to process the trauma. So you do that work just like with PTSD, where you go back to the traumatic event and, and work through it where they no longer need to avoid the traumatic event and no longer need uh, the symptom. And similarly, reducing the overall uh, stress level uh, reduces the need uh, for the symptom. Uh, and lastly, you also want to reduce um, secondary gain. So uh, people with conversion, conversion, conversion disorder aren't uh, experiencing their symptoms in order to get secondary gain. And secondary gain means getting paid, uh, getting disability payments, getting out of um, certain uh, requirements or duties. Right? They're not doing it for that, but they might get that stuff because of their uh, symptoms. So if we take away all the, the nice stuff from it, that also seems to help with getting people, uh, make it easier to give up this, the symptom and find another way to cope. Pain disorder, uh, obviously pain in one or more anatomical sites is the focus of clinical presentation, and the pain causes clinically significant stress or impairment. And in chronic uh, psychological factors are judged to have an important role in the onset, severity, exacerbation, or maintenance of the pain. Uh, so, when the pain starts, or how severe it is, when it gets worse, or as it keeps going. So, not necessarily though the onset, and that's kind of an important uh, distinction, distinction to make. Um, people with pain disorder frequently have um, real kind of organic pain. Um, you know, something happened, they, they break their leg, uh, they have an infection, whatever, and there's some pain. But with pain disorder, you, the level of pain isn't, uh, uh, can be explained by the, uh, the degree of uh, physical harm to the body. It hurts more than it should, and whenever it starts hurting more or it keeps hurting, it seems to be related to psychological factors in terms of um, 
stress or uh, other relational factors possibly but something about uh, how you're thinking feeling and behaving which may be related to the pain uh, it's not being uh, uh, faked uh, on purpose and the pain's not better accounted for by uh, another disorder like a mood or anxiety disorder uh, psychotic disorder and does not meet criteria for dyspareunia and dyspareunia uh, I kind of alluded to earlier, that's pain during sex. It's listed under the, the sexual disorders. Uh, so if you only have pain uh, during sex, that's thought to be a, a different uh, type of thing and related more to, to sexuality than uh, to just uh, generic pain. Um, so pain disorder, pretty straightforward. Pain seems to be have some sort of psychological component. But it's causing distress or pain, which uh, it's somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, silly to talk about. Well, this is pain that has a psychological component because all pain, uh, by nature, has a psychological component. Uh, you can't feel pain without a psychological component because feeling is psychological. Right? It's not. Uh, it's not physical. You know, the the um, change in in. Uh, The release of chemicals is physical, but the experience, the subjective experience of pain, is definitely psychological. So all pain is psychological. A pain disorder is whenever psychological aspects of the pain are pronounced. So in terms of uh, causes, usually there is some real physical trauma. Um, quite frequently, uh, back pain is one of the more common ones, uh, and one of the ones that's, that's hard to treat. So usually there's some physical trauma that leads to pain in the first place. And then psychological factors take over and your pain doesn't resolve the way that it should and should in the opinion of medical professionals. Uh, and one reason it might not resolve is because of kind of uh, something we talk about in terms of the pain cycle. Uh, so typically when we experience pain, we are given drugs and they make the pain uh, go away. Unfortunately, drugs change the way the body works and they change the way the body responds to pain um, sometimes uh, creating more pain in the long run so they may make you feel better now but if we stop the drugs you might have developed kind of a hypersensitivity to pain and need higher levels of drugs and if, once you stop the drugs now even small things seem to cause uh, more pain in terms of uh, treatment one of the main goals frequently is medication reduction, trying to get people down uh, to a manageable uh, level of med medication where they won't uh, be gorked out all the time. So you wanna uh, again, get their medication down to a manageable level, both so they're not so doped up they can't function, but also because we know that you can only escal escalate so far before uh, we start causing some long-term damage to the body uh, at uh, high levels of pain medication or pain medication over a long period of time. Um, other things we can try to do, uh, biofeedback seems to be helpful uh, for some people. Uh, and there's different types of biofeedback, but generally it's um, hooking you up to uh, a machine, usually a computer, right, that uh, monitors some uh, um, ongoing biological process in your body. Uh, galvanic skin response, uh, heart rate, uh, temperature, something, some some measure of how your body's working, and then uh, teaching people to uh, get some control over their body's functioning, even um, you know autonomic functioning. So, uh, learning to speed up and slow down your heart rate, and they'll have things where you know, uh, it'll be a, like on the screen you'll see this uh, little hot air balloon, and it'll be sitting on the ground, and it won't start flying until your heart rate slows. So, when you sit there and you can slow your heart rate, the balloon start taking off. If you can say, hey, look, the balloon's flying, heart rate goes up, the balloon comes back down. And you can kind of learn to have some control over your body. Uh, and the more people kind of, kind of experience uh, controlling uh, their body, they get more confidence in control of their body. So sometimes that, that leads to a reduction in the pain experience. Uh, related to that, uh, usually uh, in, involves some uh, relaxation training. Because we know that uh, stress is certainly related to the experience of pain, so we'll, we can teach you to relax and reduce muscle tension. That frequently reduces uh, the experience of pain. Uh, for some individuals, 
hypnosis uh, uh, is an effective uh, treatment. I think it depends on level of hypnotizability uh, to a large degree. But for some folks, it is helpful in, in pain management. And then uh, generally teaching stress management techniques um, with the understanding that stress contributes to the experience of pain. Uh, and just because stress experience contributes to the experience of pain doesn't mean the pain's all in your head. Uh, and even saying it's all in your head, usually people think, oh, it's all in your head, it's not real. Well, you know, if you, if you love uh, your parents, well, that's all in your head. You know, if it's not in your heart, your heart pumps the blood. It is all in your head because who you are is all in your head. It's all related to functioning of neurons and these different uh, pieces of the brain interacting in this electrical chemical function. So saying it's on your head isn't in any way diminishing someone's experience. So pain is on your head, but it is certainly real, uh, but can be uh, managed better with a lot of uh, um, a, lot of a combination of, uh, uh, of psychological and, and biological intervention. Okay. Uh, now one that maybe seems a little different from some of the others, uh, body dysmorphic disorder. Because this isn't so much about uh, disease, it's more about uh, appearance. Um, in some ways, sticks out for me at least from the other um, uh, smartphone disorders. But uh, uh, body dysmorphic disorder is preoccupation with an imagined defect in appearance, and if a slight anomaly is present, the person's concern is markedly excessive. So, uh, if you think your your ears are too big, your nose is too big or too small, uh, and either uh, it's an imagined defect, so your nose is, isn't really too big. Most people say, oh no, it's, it's not big at all, it's, it's a lovely nose. Uh, then that would qualify for this criteria. But it can also be a slight anomaly, so you might have kind of a big nose, or kind of small ears. But if your concern is excessive, if you're worried too much about it, that also meets criteria for body dysmorphic disorder. Um, and then obviously the preoccupation causes clinically significant distress or impairment. But the preoccupation is not better accounted for by another mental disorder. The one that we talk about uh, most frequently in terms of ruling stuff out would be uh, anorexia nervosa. Uh, so if you have an eating disorder, uh, and if you have an anorexia, there's a preoccupation with being fat, and uh, even uh, commonly uh, focus on certain body parts. I think my hips are too big. If you're, worried, if you're worried about your hips being too big, if that worry and that focus only occurs in the course of uh, anorexia nervosa, then you're not diagnosed also with body dysmorphic disorder. It's just anorexia uh, nervosa. Um, but again, it could be uh, any part of your, your appearance. It can be on your face, your, your legs. Uh, I knew one uh, individual who uh, felt their skin uh, was uh, imperfectly flawed and just uh, disgusting to look at and really beautiful uh, skin. So any kind of imagined defect in appearance where they're overly uh, concerned about. So what, uh, what causes body dysmorphic disorder? Uh, we, we don't really know. It, it's it's not, uh, not well studied. Um, they don't present to psychologists very often um, for study. Uh, they usually present to plastic surgeons, we'll talk about it a little bit. So not much uh, data on them. There does seem to be uh, some similarity to obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and we see that mostly because of uh, some of the treatments uh, that are used are similar, similarly effective. Uh, some of the drugs used for OCD are also used for body disorder, disorder tend to work. Uh, and the, uh, the obsession with the defect s does have this obsessional quality that feels a bit like OCD, but again, it's still different because there aren't necessarily uh, compulsions uh, uh, to deal with the anxiety, which is constant worry uh, uh, and uh, concern about looking a certain way. In terms of treatments, uh, the antidepressants, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which everything we've talked about so far pretty much uh, people take SSRIs for, the, the one to come. Um, some, some success in treating, treating uh, uh, symptoms with that. Uh, another thing which makes us think, hmm, seems a little like OCD, uh, exposure with response prevention. So having them uh, look at the imagined defect and kind of sit with it, because uh, usually they'll, they'll try to uh, hide it, uh, disguise it, cover it. Um, you may see uh, uh, big guys in the gym uh, in the summer wearing sweats. 
uh, it, it isn't because they're trying to necessarily, it might be, but it isn't necessarily because they're trying to burn off uh, body fat right? With, by sweating more. They're covering up their bodies because they're ashamed of how they look and they don't think that they're muscular uh, enough. And so and they might have body dysmorphic disorder. They think their, their pecs are too small or their calves are too small, so they hide that part of uh, their body. So we expose them to that part of the body and prevent them from covering it up and just showing them, okay, look, keep looking at it. You're not going to die. You're not going to go away. You're not going to be destroyed. Uh, you go out in public like this, people aren't going to laugh and point. See, you're going to be fine. And that tends to, to help some uh, with experiences of anxiety. Uh, as I said before, uh, a lot of these interviews don't present to, present to therapists. They present to surgeons to have these uh, um, perceived defects corrected. And some of them might think, well, wow, uh, body disorder probably uh, is a good income generator for plastic surgeons because uh, the people will always come back for more. Right? Uh, and it's true they will come back for more, but it's not really uh, a, a good thing for uh, plastic surgeons because they will never be happy with the work that's done. Um, and they're at fairly high risk for pursuing you for malpractice if you didn't, uh, didn't do it right. Uh, and they, they won't ever be happy with the level of care they receive. Even if you think you've done a beautiful job reconstructing uh, their nose or whatever, they'll think, still think it looks uh, hideous. Uh, so a lot of, um, uh, not some uh, cosmetic surgeons are starting to use uh, screening tools to uh, uh, identify uh, the level uh, of uh, concern people have about their, their, their looks and to kind of screen out people that have body dysmorphic disorder and make sure that they're psychologically healthy enough to undergo surgery. Uh, some of those surgeons do it to protect clients, but a lot of them also do it uh, to protect themselves from, uh, from lawsuits. Okay, so we've talked about all the different um, uh, somatoform disorders, and we've, and we've always said, well, they're not intentionally producing the symptoms. It's all happening at an unconscious level. Sometimes people do intentionally produce or fake or feigned symptoms. Uh, and there's two cases we'll talk about, one of which is a diagnosis, the other is not. The one that's a diagnosis, diagnosis is a uh, factitious disorder. Uh, you may have heard of uh, Munchausen's disorder or Munchausen's by proxy. Um, and Munchausen's by proxy is what would now be termed uh, factitious disorder by proxy, and Munchausen's would be factitious disorder. But factitious disorder is um, when somebody uh, does uh, either produce symptoms by uh, poisoning themselves, and injecting themselves with certain things, uh, causing an injury to, to their body in some way to create a symptom, or lying about something, just faking it. Um, but they're doing it uh, because they want to assume the sick role. They want to be the patient and be taken care of. Uh, and not taken care of in terms of, uh, you know, they're, they're broken on the streets and they need, they need a hospital bed. There are cases of that happening, uh, but they want um, psychologically, relationally, to relate to people from the point of view of a patient, and, and they feel that the only way to get kind of the care and nurturing they, they desire is to be sick. Uh, and this is a, a, a diagnosable mental disorder. Uh, and to, to have this, um, it's it's tricky to diagnose. For one thing, you have to first figure out that they're faking the symptoms which can be hard to do if they're uh, clever, you know, do a good job of faking it. And, you know, doctors usually assume that their patients are telling them the truth. You know, if you say you have these chronic headaches, they believe you have chronic headaches, and they are going to try to figure out why you have them. Um, so you have to kind of work through the, the deceptions, uh, and you also need to establish that external incentives are absent. So they're not getting anything out of this. Uh, you know, they're not getting workman's comp or getting off of some, uh, getting, getting out of some crappy job. All they're getting is the attention that they get by uh, assuming the sick. And then fictitious disorder by proxy would be uh, the same thing, except for instead of producing the symptoms in yourself, you produce them in another. And usually it's a parent producing symptoms in a child. So uh, poisoning a child or lying about a child's symptoms in order um, to get kind of care and attention from the, the nurses and, and doctors in a healthcare facility, uh, which is a really rare phenomenon. Uh, it does happen, and debatable whether or not fictitious disorder by proxy is should be a, a, a mental disorder 
or just be termed child abuse. It certainly is child abuse, but uh, it also is a mental disorder. Uh, it's debatable. But the Christmas disorder itself, causing harm to yourself, uh, is accepted as a mental disorder. Now, if you were faking your symptoms or lying about symptoms in order to get something other than the sick girl, then it's malingering. And malingering isn't a DSM diagnosis, it's just um, a phenomenon. So you don't think you have a mental disorder, you're not uh, mentally ill, you're just a faker. And this is when your motivation is for secondary gain getting something good or avoiding something bad. So getting working with comp or maybe you're uh, uh, you know, about to uh, deploy somewhere and uh, you uh, create you know, uh, four pain symptoms, uh, two GI symptoms, one sexual symptom, and one pseudo-neurological symptom. It's not somatization disorder, it's malingering because you're either you're lying on symptoms or you're poisoning yourself, you're doing something to yourself, and you're doing it in order to get out of some uh, unpleasant experience, and that would be uh, malingering. Um, which also can be hard to uh, identify uh, if the person is um, particularly experienced, uh, especially individuals who are in the healthcare field, they're pretty good at faking illnesses. People who aren't in the healthcare field uh, aren't as good at it. Uh, they may be a bit naive about, um, about uh, um, symptoms and may make up symptoms that are uh, so unreasonable and unfathomable and inconsistent that uh, they can be easier to detect. But again, more experienced, knowledgeable people People that just study hard uh, can do a pretty good job at, uh, at faking being sick. So you need to uh, rule that out as a possibility. Um, but the tricky thing is, just because somebody gets secondary gain, just because like just because somebody is getting workman's comp for their uh, pain symptoms, doesn't mean that they're malingering. It makes it more likely, but not necessarily. They could have pain disorder. They could not be intentionally creating, uh, faking, or producing symptoms. Uh, so it's not sometimes a tricky thing uh, to discern. Uh, okay, so that's it for now for uh, dissociative disorders and somatization disorders. And again, the key thing here overall is these are ways of coping with stress and, and often really traumatic stressful events by either uh, dissociating parts of the uh, cognitive emotional experience or by uh, redirecting uh, the stress in some sort of um, physical or somatic manifestation. Uh, that's it for now. Take care.